crushed metal car parts, right? This is by John Chamberlain. It's a relief. It's one of only four he made in 1964. He made it while working with his friend, Donald Judd. What not too many people know is that Donald Judd did not agree with this distinction between high modernism and minimalism. He did in some ways. It behooved him to do so, to distinguish himself from the previous generation. But <clears throat> in his um, office, home slash studio in New York in the early years, I think it was Spring Street, his office was a totally minimal space. One desk, one chair, one painting. That painting was a small homage to the square by Joseph Albers. When Judd uh, had set up uh, his foundation in Marfa, he went to the Albers Foundation and said, I would really like to, to curate a show of Joseph Albers here at Marfa. He did that. He, he really felt that Albers was, uh, he was minimalism before minimalism. minimalism. Uh, at any rate, so the Chamberlain, he made those four reliefs, all working with Judd in 64, and Judd acquired three out of the four reliefs, so you don't get to see them unless you go to Marfa. We have the one other. It has not been shown because it has some cracking, it's, it's, uh, it has some structural distinctions. But in this show, it's worth showing it because Albers, by way of Judd, inspired Chamberlain for one brief moment in his career to move away from the crushed and the found to the constructed and the clear. And uh, Stella, of course, so of course said, well, I didn't get anything from Albers. I didn't study under Interesting that though that after Albers finally retired from Yale in mid 1961, that <clears throat> there's a serious feeling of loss among faculty and students. So who did they bring in? Frank Stella to bring back the idea of the basic, the fundamentals, the color, and the structure. Also, Albers is known to have said when looking at Frank Stella's works, like this one, saying. What does he mean? That's not his work, that's my work. He just ripped me off. So, um, tensions between high formalism and high modernism and, and, and early uh, minimalism there is. But visually, it's all there. And the fact is, is that many of them did exhibit together. They did know each other's work. And many of them admired the older masters, even though it fell out of fashion to acknowledge admiration for um, any of those old funny duddies. So that is the whole of the installation. And I went over by five and a half minutes. So I don't know if you have questions or not. Should we go questions five minutes or can we just run yeah. away? Questions are fine. Yeah. Uh, what do we know about how he made and painted the homage to the square? Would he do the entire background square and then paint the next square on top, or would he just do the border of the background square? He tells you on the back of each of his paintings how he did them. And they basically came in two or three very subtle differences. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> to the the paintings were based on what he had learned himself by studying interactions of colors. So in some cases, each of those is just an entity unto itself. In other cases, they are overlapping, one on top of the other. In some cases, the ones in the center may be overlapping, but the ones at the side may be <coughs> uh, independent, just one layer. He took the paints, the acrylic paints, straight out of the tube, because by this time, in the you know, early 60s, acrylic paints came in many, many different hues already in the tube, and so he no longer mixed his colors. <coughs> he applied them with a palette knife, which is one of the reasons I think his, the surfaces of his paintings aren't very effective. Sometimes also painted with a brush, uh, but first applied with a palette knife and then came back with a brush. Um, you can tell what he used because on the back of every one of them he wrote exactly what pigment by which manufacturer he used for which part of the painting and whether it was a single or double or triple layer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. At the Bauhaus exhibit in MoMA, they have some pieces of furniture designed by Albers, and he also designed an, an alphabet script. Actually, I actually almost got that alphabet script to come here. We just didn't have the money to build a grade for it. But that was interesting, because I had no idea. 
He was there, I mean, Bauhaus was about design. The fine arts, including painting, sculpture, and architecture, and design became the fourth fine art. And as time went on, architecture and design became more and more important because they're practical, they could be applied. He was using fiberboard. Uh, the brand name at that time that virtually all artists used was masonite fiberboard. Uh, <clears throat> masonite fiberboard has a smooth side and a rough side. <clears throat> he was known to use both. So you can look at painting and you can see that the smoother ones, the ones that I think are more successful, the ones painted on the smooth side. The ones <clears throat> that are painted on the rough side, I think, could have been more successful. I mean, they add a little bit of texture, very small, almost not quite discernible level of texture, which helps enliven, I think, uh, the, the surface of the paintings. But he didn't develop that in the way he used paint in any way. So um, he, <clears throat> the larger works, like the glow, um, they're on canvas. So when the smaller the paintings that are like 18 by 18, uh, 24 by 24. <clears throat> I the next one up is 32 by 32. Those tend to be on, on fiberboard, but then the bigger paintings, 40 by 40 and 48 by 48, uh, tend to be on canvas. <clears throat> <clears throat> 